Thank you to everybody for coming. Uh, welcome to our event today. We're all here for the Harlem Shake, is that right? Oh, I hope not. We're actually here for Managing Foreign Policy in the Information Age. Um, my name is Shanti Kalathal, and I'm editor of this volume, and we're very happy today to hear from our panel of distinguished authors and um, who will be talking about their work. Before I introduce the panel, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, how this all came about. Um, it started with a conversation with the then director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown, Paula Newberg, who was very interested in some of these themes. And uh, I should note that there's many thanks are due to the Institute for supporting this project over the last two years. It certainly wouldn't have occurred without them. Um, the themes in my discussions with Paula and with ISD, it became clear that there are a number of different conversations taking place at a number of different levels across a number of different disciplines. Um, through it all, certain common themes were emerging. One was that we tended to understand the impact of the information age in terms of easily digestible nuggets. So for instance, the Harlem Shake, right? Everybody or many people have heard about this now. We understand that it's a meme that spreads rapidly and instantaneously and really engulfs us without even having time to understand what it's all about. Um, a similar, you know, similar trends are happening all throughout the worlds of diplomacy, development, and security. Um, it may not be the Harlem Shake exactly, but certainly we've heard examples of tweets from ambassadors or embassies going viral and having actual impacts on foreign events, um, on uh, certain practices like open government data that are rapidly taking hold in the development world. And yet we're not really taking a step back to understand how these processes may all fit together, may have common themes that emerge, and how do we better understand these processes um, delinked from technology. So while many of these phenomena are being enabled by the ubiquitous flow of information that we now experience around the world, um, they're not necessarily technology dependent. And so the interest in this volume was to isolate some of these broader themes that have to do with development, diplomacy, and security in the information age, and yet not necessarily have them all rest on technology per se in that they don't actually have to be about tweeting ambassadors. They may be about how themes that emerge are relevant to foreign policy in general. So the two themes that we chose to focus on for this volume were uh, increased transparency and increased volatility throughout international affairs. Across these different disciplines, those were the two themes that really stood out as being phenomena that practitioners and policymakers and scholars were having to grapple with uh, without necessarily understanding some of the connective tissue between these different disciplines or understanding um, how it is that transparency and volatility are affecting international affairs. And so we decided to examine these two concepts and unpack them a little bit across these three different disciplines. And represented on the panel today, we do have people speaking from each of these disciplines and indeed bridging some of them um, to talk about some of those themes and their relevance in foreign policy and international affairs today. Um, one thing that I noticed in looking through all the papers is that many of them tended to stress certain common conclusions, particularly with respect to crafting policy in the information age. And um, very briefly, um, what I found is that they all emphasize the themes of resilience, of credibility, and adaptability. And that tended to be true whether it was diplomacy, development, or security that we were talking about. And uh, I think in the panel during the discussion, some of our panelists will also be raising those themes um, and talking about their relevance. Um, so with that, I thought I would introduce the panel today. Um, I'll start right here with Jerry Hyman, who's a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the president of the Hills Program on Governance since 2007. He was formerly the director of the U.S. Agency for International Development's Global Office of Democracy and Governance. Um, Jerry, for anybody who works in development, is a very well-known face and name, and um, you probably know that he's responsible for developing uh, much of USAID's democracy and governance programming over um, a number of years. Um, and Jerry will be talking about the intersection between diplomacy and development and um, uh, some of the themes that arise there. 
Um, next, we have Joe Siegel, who is a scholar of the political economy of democratic transitions and their implications for development and stability. He is uh, dual-hatted at both the National Defense University and the University of Maryland. Um, his work as a scholar, field practitioner, and policy advisor focuses on the challenges of stabilizing fragile states, the economic threats to democratic transitions, and the means by which societies overcome autocratic legacies to create institutions of accountability. Um, and in his uh, paper for this volume, Joe has explored in particular the challenges facing fragile states, and so he'll be able to talk a little bit more about that um, today. Um, we next have Jim Herlong, who is a forward-thinking strategic intelligence and information technology leader and cyber strategy and security subject matter expert. Um, Jim has worked on cyber issues throughout his career and has made notable contributions to Homeland Security um, and in the building of the Coast Guard Cyber Command. Um, he is a graduate of the United States Coast Guard Academy and holds degrees in intelligence. And he'll be able to speak on cybersecurity, um, focusing on um, sort of the, the practitioner's uh, perspective, I suppose, in dealing with some of these issues and in looking at security very broadly. Um, and um, finally, we'll have Lorelai Kelly, who's with the New America Foundation. She's a research fellow with the Open Technology Institute. She's piloting approaches to re-engineer how knowledge is shared with Congress, including the adoption of new technologies and innovations for local civic engagement. Um, she formally directed the New Strategic Security Initiative, which educated Americans and elected leaders about security in an inter interconnected world. Um, and she's published widely on these issues. If you've come to other New America events, you probably know this as well. Um, she's been long been a voice for trying to understand security from a different perspective. Um, and Lorelai will be laying out some of the broad themes, um, particularly focusing on themes of resilience and grand strategy um, as it has to do with security. Um, and finally, um, we'll have as our discussant Tim Moorer, who is um, with the New America Foundation. He's actually sitting in the front here. We um, have such a large panel today, we could not have everybody sitting at the front. Um, but Tim will be standing up at the end to comment on all of the papers and to draw some common themes between them. Uh, he focuses on internet policy here at the New America Foundation at the Open Technology Institutes. And he conducts research on internet govern governance, human rights policy, and cybersecurity. He's been published by Foreign Policy in a number of outlets. And, uh, you know, I think he brings a um, very fresh and engaged perspective. If you follow New America's blogs and other writings, he's always blogging about various aspects of these issues, whether it's digital diplomacy or cybersecurity. So I'm sure he'll have some um, fascinating and fresh insights. Um, so with that, I think I'll wrap up and uh, let the panel take it away. So, Jerry. Thank you, Shanti. Um, thanks to the Institute as well. So I've already learned uh, two uh, terms. One is tweeting ambassadors, and the other is cyber diplomacy. So for me, this is already a win-win uh, arrangement, and it's only a couple minutes old. Um, the, um, I thought I'd sort of lay the context. Most of my work's been in development, as Shanti said, but I thought I'd spend a better of time on the diplomacy side today just to show you that there's cross-sectoral work, uh, as Shanti suggested earlier. Um, so if you go back, really, thousands of years, uh, <coughs> diplomacy in China, China em emissaries uh, all over the, uh, in, in, in Europe before there were uh, nation states and so on, the traditional element of diplomacy was the sort of empowered ambassador or emissary. Uh, and uh, these were sovereign to sovereign kinds of relationships, uh, normally quiet, normally behind the scenes, normally each sovereign's emissary was there to protect the interests of the, his or her own, well, his mostly so sovereign, and to uh, project uh, that, those interests to the, to the other emissary. Um, and so prior to, uh, uh, the earliest cyber uh, change, which is telephones tele or telegraphs, telephones, uh, these emissaries were miles and days and months from their home capitals, and therefore had a lot of uh, a lot of discretion as to how they represented the interests and w went with only general uh, instructions. As communications uh, became more um, prominent uh, or became more available, uh, the leash of these uh, sovereign ambassadors became shorter and shorter. 
So uh, you could get instructions from capital uh, pretty quickly once you had a telegraph and uh, instantaneously as, uh, as uh, communications developed. As a result, the, the leash, so to speak, of the emissaries became shorter and shorter. They got instructions about what they should say at the next meeting and what, they should, what words they should use, what words they shouldn't use, um, who they should direct their, uh, their talk to, and so on. Um, and that changed, uh, really, the notion of, uh, of uh, diplomacy from uh, sovereign, sovereign to sovereign through a, an intermediary to a much more direct relationship. Still, um, these relationships uh, had to do, were, were mostly done behind closed doors. Uh, and the ob objective was to reach an agreement, reach a, uh, sometimes written, sometimes not, as to how these two sovereign entities uh, were to conduct their relations with one another. The new context, uh, I would say, uh, in the last maybe 50 years, and even more recently than that, is to have, is engages a new set of actors and a new set of, of uh, contexts of, of relationships. Uh, the, clearly, uh, states are only one kind of context, only, and state-to-state -state relationships are now only one kind of context in which, uh, or between which, uh, diplomacy presumably, and development as well, presumably take place. So there are now a fracturing of these states in many cases to fragile, failing, fragmented, conflict, all whatever kind of adjective you want to use, environments in which it's not clear who's having what relationships with whom and under what conditions. So the United States, let's say, or a donor uh, in, in a country that has, is conflict-ridden is not only going to have relationships with the government, which purports to speak for the entire country, but is probably going to, have to, is going to be called upon to have relationships with a variety of other non-state actors, some of which are benign, some of which are not, uh, and in, in but which affect the larger relationship between uh, the, one, the one entity and, and the other, if the other even is an entity. So the state-to-state -state model has uh, begun to wither a bit at the edges, and particularly as attention has been drawn more and more to these failed and failing and fragmented and, and war-torn countries uh, that are hard to categorize even, categorize even as, as countries. Um, so Syria, for example, is a little bit hard to figure out what you would do as a diplomatic or development matter if you were trying to do something about uh, in, in Syria right, right, right now. And the number of these contexts of, of uh, conflict-ridden and fractured states it has grown substantially, as you know, over the last uh, few years. Terrorism is another kind of uh, element that uh, shows no state boundary. And uh, whether you can have um, a relationship uh, or whether you want to have a relationship with a, a terrorist organization and what that would look like are, is obviously problematic. Uh, just this morning, President Karzai has accused the United States of having uh, illicit, from his perspective at least, relationships with the Taliban. Taliban's not a, not a state, not an entity, not a sovereign. Uh, and whether he's right or whether he's wrong, clearly there are some kinds of direct and indirect relationships uh, that could grow up between uh, a state and a non-state actor or between non-state actors and one another. And, and as uh, Shanti said in her introductory uh, essay in this volume, kind of networks. So you have inter networks that, over, that, that uh, don't um, don't recognize state boundaries, uh, are across state boundaries, and obviously Al-Qaeda is uh, the most obvious example of that. So governments become only one kind of actor in the, in the necessary relationships uh, between actors across borders and within borders. And the multiplicity of, of those kinds of actors, multiplicity of those kinds of environments has grown and made uh, things a lot more complicated. Uh, and the 
new age, the new transparent or new media has made those relationships even more complicated because it now is possible uh, to have a variety of relationships that are not face to face and that are beyond the abilities of governments even to deal with, let alone to control. So NGOs are now, have now become a major feature in at least uh, the, the foreign policy and diplomatic policy and certainly in the development policy of most of the donor countries. Uh, and you saw that, for example, uh, in the last three secretaries, uh, Secretary Albright, Secretary Rice, and Secretary Clinton, all have made uh, particular uh, attempts at getting out of the cocoon of just talking internally to between them in meetings with the other government, have gone to universities, have gone to NGOs, have gone outside of the capital and so on to engage the larger uh, population in, uh, in the country. Still, uh, until relatively recently, media was uh, controlled pretty much by governments. Uh, and in fact, the first targets of most coups, uh, if you go back 15 or 20 years and certainly longer than that, were to capture the national broadcasting system so that you could control the message around the country. Well, it, it, I don't know how many coups now even try to get the national broadcaster because it, you've now got such a broad expansion of the ways in which people can communicate with one another that that's only one of the many mechanisms of doing so. And so um, as, instead of having sovereign agreements and personal relationships between sovereign governments, we now have what uh, David Ferris in this volume calls public agreements secretly arrived at. And public diplomacy is perhaps now at more central than ever and is part of uh, the core mission of any foreign ministry, uh, to have a public diplomacy uh, and not just state-to-state -state diplomacy. Well, uh, okay, all of this is complicated by the new media, by the new technology, by state-controlled media no longer being a monopoly and so forth and so on. And that gets to the thing where, in, in which uh, the new media really complicates, it seems to me, a lot of uh, things that might uh, might be useful and makes them more difficult. When WikiLeaks exposed uh, the secret assessments left behind in secret cables, uh, it, it, it was a case in which almost anybody can publish whatever they like, wherever they want, in any kind of environment. And it changes, it seems to me, the nature, or it will change, the nature of diplomacy and development in ways that are hard, I think, to predict, but not always beneficial. So for example, Whereas before, quote, being diplomatic uh, was a kind of adjective that you could apply to individuals as well. You keep secrets. You don't say things in, that are uh, inopportune in public. You don't tell someone that they're fat or ugly. That's all diplomatic. You keep your personal views to yourself, and you are uh, forthright uh, with, with, uh, care, with, with care. The new transparency exposes absolutely everything uh, and without favoritism. And the result, for example, in a negotiation, consider just one context. Suppose you have a negotiation between states and everything becomes public. Well, you don't want everything to become public if you want a true negotiation. You want the negotiators to be able to probe one another's positions, to put out hypotheticals, to consider alternatives without necessarily being having these things broadcast because if you did broadcast them, uh, you, would, you would wind up uh, with a lot of unfortunate commentary on what is not actually the position of, of your sovereign. The result of that is that uh, we have indiscretions, gossip, et cetera, et cetera, which are often uh, spoil a diplomatic initiative and make uh, the exposure uh, public or expose things before they are ripe for doing so. So if you can imagine, it, it would be impossible for Kissinger to open up to China in an environment like this, where he goes to Pakistan in the middle of the night, leaves on a plane, gets on the plane, goes to Beijing, comes back, nobody knows he's even gone to China. Impossible. In a, in a world of, uh, of WikiLeaks and Twitters and Twittering ambassadors uh, and, and other kinds of things like that. The, the question is not, therefore, I think it's, the, 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 it's no longer possible to, to live life without this. So the question is, how can a state 
or how can two parties that are in diplomatic or development, I don't want to have time to go to the development side, relationships with one another, how do they conduct their relationships in a world in which there is no longer any expectation, reasonable expectation of privacy? So it's not just in the Sixth Amendment case, what does the public have in the United States, a reasonable expectation of being private, that is now in the international domain as well. And there is, it seems to me, very little area in which you can have a reasonable expectation of privacy to conduct sensitive discussions uh, between, uh, between entities, whether they be state entities or sub-state entities. Well, thanks. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, um, well, before I start, I want to thank also Shanti for her leadership of this project. It's been an honor to participate, and thank you to the New American Foundation for hosting us today. Um, as Shanti said, uh, I was going to talk about the changing role of uh, information communication technology, ICT, in fragile states, and particularly how this is um, uh, changing the tension between volatility and transparency in these contexts. Now, most of us are familiar with the volatility that we see. Uh, uh, a good example of this was, uh, you know, last September when the amateur video was posted on YouTube um, uh, called The Innocent of Muslims, very denigrating to Islam in, in general. Uh, this posting went viral in many Muslim countries. It led to protest riots and a number of deaths. And it led to, you know, uh, various um, uh, protests and some damage done to various uh, U.S. missions in these countries as well. You know, another dimension of the volatility and the heightened volatility we see is in the use of ICT by what we call spoilers. Uh, and these are, you know, leaders of militant groups, criminal organizations, um, uh, various insurgencies that are conducting some sort of asymmetric warfare uh, in, you know, marginalized areas of a, uh, of a fragile state. And whose um, capacity really depends on their ability to attract local support. ICT has given them a huge lever in reaching far more people at low cost than they ever could have done before. And so it has empowered these spoilers and has really um, focused the, you know, put a premium on the importance of gaining trust and local support um, for, uh, you know, the, the security challenges in fragile states. These spoilers play up whatever grievances there might be in marginalized areas. And, you know, this is often uh, based on ethnic and social divisions uh, within a society. And they are really trying to command an alternative narrative to the one promoted by the government. Often it's a negative narrative. It's a reason why people should join their insurgency or, or armed um, revolt. And so um, this is contributing to greater volatility in many fragile states. Now, on the transparency side, you know, despite these um, uh, you know, vulnerabilities to greater, vulner to, to, um, greater volatility, we're seeing, um, you know, that ICT is also contributing to greater levels of stability. And you know, it's important to keep in mind that this is emerging out of a context where fragile states have often been characterized by high levels of restricted information. They've been cl closed societies. And so uh, regimes that have been in power in, in these places have been able to command the narrative. Um, and they've been able to uh, you know, conduct human rights abuses or engage in corruption really under the radar without people knowing um, or without much public pressure for doing so. And because of the challenges of collective action where it's a lot harder to organize a majority who may be disadvantaged by a particular policy, um, they've been able to you know, perpetuate that over time. They've enjoyed an asymmetry of information 
control, um, which contributed to their lower levels of development performance and higher levels of insecurity. Um, now, <clears throat> with the emergence of ICT in many fragile states, you know, in Africa today, 50% uh, of all adults have access to a cell phone. You know, with this expansion of access to information, you're seeing a breakdown in this asymmetry of information. This is having direct effects on governance, uh, development, and security uh, in many of these contexts. Let me just run through a couple of the avenues by which information is contributing to greater stability. First, I would highlight the heightened legitimacy we're seeing. Um, you know, with more information, there's a more vibrant marketplace of ideas. Uh, you know, population is becoming more um, educated and aware of the various opinions that are out there, and this is leading to uh, a more po an informed policy dialogue and decision-making process. It also contributes directly to um, better elections. And so with more access to information, the quality of debate in elections is elevated. The recent Kenya election, which got a lot of coverage, is an example of this. While controversial in other ways, um, they had more debate than they've ever had in Kenya. They had a number of televised debate that were tweeted. Um, the election process itself was uh, uh, something you could monitor online. You could actually track the election results by district you know, off your, your cell phone or off the computer. And so it, it contributed a, a much greater degree of, of transparency to the process and therefore legitimacy to the outcome, even though it was highly contested and it's still controversial for other reasons. Um, you know, the result was 50.3% for the declared winner. Um, and people, um, uh, I think, at least recognize that the process was uh, was more transparent than what it's been in the past. And you know, this, in turn, is reducing a key driver of instability in many fragile states. Indeed, a lot of the li uh, conflict literature has shown that illegitimacy is one of the key reasons that uh, foment grievances that, that lead to greater levels of conflict. And uh, autocratic states have much higher propensities for conflict than what we see in more open societies. You know, a second driver of stability that we're seeing with ICT is, it, is the transparency issue with regards to corruption. Um, more information uh, makes it harder to, um, uh, to uh, um, misuse data, misuse uh, state resources, and, um, and, and therefore uh, contribute to uh, more um, insecurity and lack of uh, development investments on the part of government. Um, it also, you know, greater access to information is also facilitating greater organizational capacity among the majority. And uh, as a result, they can more actively represent their interest. It's breaking down some of the collective action challenges. And so we're having higher levels of accountability uh, in these societies. Third vehicle that I would highlight is that it's fostering more responsiveness on the part of government. When there's more information, there's more pressure for the government to, to act when there are uh, crises in a society. For, for some time, it's been recognized that democracies are more responsive when, there is a, when there's a looming famine or other crisis in a society. It's because they feel pressure. The information's on the front pages of the papers or in media, and the same is happening uh, on the ICT level, that um, no longer are governments able to close off that information, that dialogue. And they're under greater pressure, both nationally and internationally, to act when there is a crisis of uh, some type uh, or another. And so the upshot is that we have um, you know, parallel processes where there's greater short-term volatility, but long-term institutionally, there's greater stability in fragile states because of the greater access to information. And I think I'd highlight two policy implications from that. One is that um, you know, governments need to be more um, deliberate and effective in reaching out to populations than they have in the past. Jerry talked about public diplomacy for the international community, but there's a need to, be, to, to engage in public diplomacy 
within your own societies to much greater extent because of this notion that uh, there's a competition for trust and, the, and, com and a competition for the narrative within many fragile states and their communities. The governments need to do, do a much better job of connecting with and communicating with communities to gain that trust. And they need to do that by working with civil society groups and with media who often have far higher levels of trust within these communities than does the government. The second policy implication I would highlight um, is that we need to recognize that ICT is part of a broader governance process. And uh, it, if for ICT to, to be effectively used from an accountability standpoint, it requires independent actors. It requires civil society, it requires media, it requires bloggers. Uh, these are the folks who gather information, disseminate it, analyze it. It doesn't happen on its own. And for these actors to be effective, they need to be protected. Uh, unfortunately, in many fragile state settings, the instinct is to intimidate these actors. And uh, if we're going to see some of the stabilizing benefits of ICT, uh, greater attention needs to be spent on protecting them. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to also start by thanking uh, Shanti and the New America Foundation. It's, uh, as she said, it, it's an opportunity for a practitioner um, to take part in this particular forum, which is a, a great opportunity for me, and, and I think I can speak for my co-author, who's who's not here as well. And and that's kind of the, just, you know, if you, you read the paper, and I hope you do in the book, and the talk today will be kind of from that perspective. Um, as, a, as a military and an intelligence professional, um, we're always kind of looking, you know, how do you get advantage over your adversary? Um, and that's kind of the, the part of the approach we took. Um, and yes, the Coast Guard is part of the military. I just want to clear that bad joke. No, okay. Um, <laughs> So, it, you know, looking at it, um, as in the military and intelligence, you're always bombarded with things such as information dominance um, and decision superiority. And when we kind of looked at that, we thought, you know, information dominance, great concept, but there's something missing. Um, and as an IT guy, you know, I'm very familiar with Nicholas Carr talking about, you know, IT doesn't matter. You know, so, you know, we take a look at it as information itself does not give you competitive advantage. The infrastructure doesn't give you kind of a competitive advantage. So what what would? Um, and so what we kind of came up with um, is what's going to give you competitive advantage is to be able to outthink your your adversary. Um, and so I'm going to, and we and looked at that in terms of strategy, and uh, we're going to look at that, and I'm going to dive deeper into uh, looking at the strategy of our, our nearest competitor, China. Um, but the model, so we're military guys, so we needed some kind of model or, or something to, to attack. Um, and what we came up with, and you read in the paper, it's called cognitive dominance. So one, it's kind of got a catchy title, but um, we needed some kind of framework to assess the strategy uh, of, of our competitor. Hopefully, you know, assess it against our own and, and learn from that. Um, cognitive dom dominance differs from kind of information dominance uh, in that it makes people and expertise really the center of things. Um, it's, uh, you know, the expertise, we all have things that we can kind of pull out of our head, we can put in a database and we can share. And obviously with the infrastructure we have today in the electromagnetic, electromagnetic domain, we can connect. But there are things that you just know. Um, that with you know just by seeing it so it's really necessary to have connection to the people and not just the technology um, there are plenty of details in the you know in, in terms of the time and what I want to focus on there's plenty of details about cognitive dominance in the paper but we came up with basic five principles um, one cognitive depth um, and that's really the people and the expertise so we have to actually develop all of these people that we want to connect and have connected at all times to provide that expertise so we can get some kind of uh, decision superiority or outthink our adversary. Uh, cognitive strength, um, and that's the ability to actually take those people and that information and make better decisions faster than the folks that we're, uh, we're working against. Um, cognitive agility, and that's to bring the right information and the right expertise quicker. And that's really the infrastructure piece. We can't you know, I said IT doesn't matter, but it, it does. You have to have it, and everyone else kind of does. Um, cognitive defense, and this is probably where you're looking at your traditional cybersecurity. So we don't want to be disrupted while we're trying to conduct our operations or put the right people in touch with the right information. And then cognitive resilience. Um, so we, you have to be able to recover. Uh, I think uh, 
it's a given that, uh, you know, if you operate in cyberspace or the electromagnetic domain, you use networks, at some point you will be compromised, you probably are, and just don't know it, but you have to be able to recover from that and, and get back so you can, again, um, make decisions better and faster than your adversary. Um, so we, we wanted to look at a country, uh, I said China, that we thought was kind of, as we say, half lurching, half running towards this kind of uh, cognitive dominance. Um, lucky, I guess, is that you know there hasn't been any reporting in the last few months on China and cyberspace. Okay, another really bad joke, right? So there's lots of things out there, right? Um, you know, so I'm not picking on China. Uh, as a matter of fact, we you know use it as a as a case study. Um, but um, there's in taking a look at their strategy and first, and you know, I'll go into some examples of I think what they're doing to actually achieve cognitive dominance and, and operate effectively and some may say superior, superior, a little more superior than we are in, in cyberspace. My bosses are not going to be happy with that, but um, it, it's, uh, you got to look at their, their um, strategic foundation. So um, in one, they, China, and if you read their, their strategy documents, they view the electromagnetic spectrum as a war fighting domain. So um, it, and you can say we do the same here, uh, here in the U.S. Um, Another important thing, and, and we all like to keep our state secrets and our strategies, you know, so it's hard to find uh, exactly what truly our other states are thinking and, and how they want to operate, um, but the fine folks um, at the Foreign Military Studies Office, that's the Army, the Naval War College, um, it, it, reviewing their kind of open source information, you know, they've come to say that, you know, China views um, that military, uh, their advantage for national, national um, power comes in economic and military advantage um, and that they need to also be very skilled in information warfare. So this idea of operating effectively in the electromagnetic domain is very important to them. Uh, in fact, if you look at their defense white papers that come out 2007-2008, um, it, it emphasizes the ability to operate in a highly complex electromagnetic environment. So this is very important. Um, and they've come up with a uh, with a concept called integrated network electronic warfare. And that's where we're saying they're kind of achieving or executing this cognitive dominance within that framework. And what that is, it's a, it's a seamless integration of electronic warfare and computer network warfare. The computer network warfare is the piece that attacks the layers where you're looking at the, at the processing. So that's where the human interaction comes. Um, and, and there, you have the ability to, you know, change information, prevent information from being received, try to affect that decision making. The electronic warfare piece um, attacks kind of the signals um, and, and certain devices. So I can stop you from connecting that expertise to that particular decision maker, or I can reduce that capability. Um, and it's, it's a, I think it's pretty important um, because I think if you look at some, you know, kind of our, not as a strategy, but how we're organized in the U.S., we still have, uh, we haven't quite put those two together. Um, we still in, operate in what I uh, heard one general call uh, cylinders of excellence. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so executing cognitive dominance, we kind of took a look at, based on the five principles and see what exactly was, was China doing um, to, to give us the impression that, yes, they're effectively executing the strategy. Um, so in cognitive depth, huge investment in skilled and educated population. Um, sure, the numbers are different, but quite frankly, they graduate a lot more engineering, IT, um, science-related folks than we do. Um, if you read some of their, again, some of their open source reporting, uh, they train their leadership at all echelons to be very uh, in tune with uh, information warfare and, and have established several information warfare universities. So they're pulling that strength out. Um, cogn cognitive strength, uh, truly expert hackers, um, you can read the, uh, the open source reporting on that. Um, the big piece here is their cyber reconnaissance and espionage. And these are two very important tools um, that, uh, that allow them to kind of carry out, uh, carry out their operations. And it's probably where we've seen probably the most reporting in the news, right? Uh, NASA, clear defense contractors, Coca-Cola, Google, New York Times. Um, the range of information that's stolen um, is interesting because it, it's not just military. It's not just taking military secrets to give you advantage in, say, a shooting war. It's stealing intellectual property so that I can reduce re research and development times and, grant, and, and gain an economic advantage. Um, 
it's uh, getting positions ahead of negotiations, as, as we've heard a little earlier. It's uh, potentially stopping information that might be embarrassing to the government or, or um, you know, senior officials. So there's a, there's, there's a lot, of, uh, lot of objectives they're achieving with these particular tools. Um, cognitive agility, so uh, massive in investment in infrastructure. You have that many people that are that connected and lots of digital natives, you, you, need, to, uh, you need to actually um, have an infrastructure for them to get connected. Um, the one thing, and I, and I, see, I, see, I see the note, but um, Mandiant, so there's a report out now, Advanced Persi Persistent Threat, and I encourage you to read it. They tracked a lot, and they kind of sum it up uh, with a couple of good pieces that uh, uh, current intact infrastructure includes a thousand servers. That's resilience and agility. That um, the, uh, and, and what this is probably the best one I like, because it really takes the people, is that um, given the volume, duration, type of attack activity, operators would need to be directly supported by linguists, open source researchers, malware authors, industry experts, and translate the task requests from requesters to operators. They get the people piece. This is kind of a people problem. No. So, um, you know, and, and kind of I'll get to it. We could debate the execution, you know, the intent of why they're doing it. That was not necessarily the intent of what this paper was about. Um, we wanted to explore um, and emphasize, you know, whether China thinks of their strategy. And we didn't really care if they thought it was or it wasn't. What matters is that China's actions demonstrate an understanding of the modern information environment um, and that they use the principles of cognitive dominance to, to be able to outthink their adversaries. Um, it's not to say that it's not security implications for the U.S. China's actions certainly are. Stolen intellectual property um, has hit us, uh, to say the least. We all hear about cyber Pearl Harbors, and we hear about cyber 9-11s, which I'm not quite sure are yet, uh, about turning out the lights. Um, but again, the discussion, the intent, and the implications wasn't, wasn't what we were trying to do. We wanted to highlight a near competitor um, who has a clear understanding of the modern information age and hope that we could actually learn from them. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I am actually not going to talk about what I wrote very much because I have a colleague here, Tim, who's going to go into the details of cybersecurity. Instead, I'm going to focus on what we like to call grand strategy, and I'm also going to practice uh, bridging the gap uh, between sort of institutional jargon that we like to talk about in national security and maybe the broader audience, certainly the younger cohort that I hope is paying attention to this whole conversation. So first, um, I'd like to point out that at Open Technology Institute, we're really uh, one of our big motivations motivations is building the uh, digital uh, global town square. And we believe that um, that connectivity and connectedness is, is a universal human right. And it's got to extend to the internet and include access to open technology and platforms, uh, ultimately to include uh, all people and improve their prospects of self-determination and the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. How do we get there? So this is the grand strategy, is how do we get there in a world of transparency and volatility? And hopefully I'll only use those words twice in my talk. <laughs> uh, so what is grand strategy? Grand strategy, I like to say, it's the big picture, it's the eyes on the prize. In a movie, it's the plot line that propels the story forward and hopefully takes us to the happy ending. So what does grand strategy look like in national security? Well, I'll give you an example from the past. Uh, the, U the world used to be, and this is before 1991, that's sort of when I started getting interested in national security. I lived in Berlin in 1989, so you can imagine it was an exciting year. Um, the world used to be easily measured. It used to be easily framed as sort of linear and, and, and with scalable solutions, rational and predictable. This policy, this, this um, you know, top line was called containment. And it, it relied on continual mutual military preparedness and the threat of war between the Soviets and the United States to maintain the peace. Uh, the acronym that described this posture in the world was Mutual Assured Destruction, MAD. People probably remember that. Um, it went like this, basically, strike first, die second. In contrast, today's world appears much more chaotic, often random, unpredictable. It, um, the solutions also have to include humans. So how, how we define modern security is at play right now with this connectivity, this volatility, this transparency being key themes. So how do we create a new framework? Could we call it something like mutual assured connection? 
to, to, to flip us 180 degrees. I'll put it simply again. We spent the last century perfecting how we were all going to die together. We need to spend this century figuring out how we're all going to live together. That's basically the thesis for the grand strategy for the next 100 years. So issues of war and peace is where this stuff is really, really important. I worked in Congress uh, from the late 90s up till 2006. I really saw the failure of this uh, throughout that 10 years. You can imagine we both had Afghanistan and um, Iraq, and we had lots and lots of, of global engagement interventions throughout the 90s that we haven't fully understood, and a lot of those lessons are not yet reflected in our policies nor our national security strategies. So these issues of war and peace are often the most important responsibilities of citizens and their elected leaders, yet our over-reliance to this day on coercion and control, centralization, shows really how much our leadership continues to execute a strategy that's stuck firmly in the past. And, there, and, and our institutions today are often incapable of addressing the sort of distributed and human-centered threats that we face today. And so if we define connectivity as a security principle, in today's world, I'll just say three things we need to pay attention to is that our security must address the safety of people across and within our own borders. We can't achieve security alone anymore, and we need a new combination of policies and resources to be secure. So across the globe, this has been tremendous in the last two years, a profound shift is underway. Demands for inclusion are redistributing power from hierarchies to individuals and communities. These changes will ultimately be a blend of up, you know, top-down and bottom-up strategies and, and directives. And attaining this goal is going to require a, a kind of global network of individuals and groups who see themselves as stakeholders in power sharing and also legitimate voices in determining a shared future. This space between institutions and individuals is often called civil society. So I'd like to put forward what we need is a strategy, a security strategy for civil society. What this is going to require of us is to support these individuals who are taking these stands. Social media is actually doing a lot of this already. We've seen it uh, certainly in, in Egypt. It's something that, that wasn't evident in Berlin in 1989 that's accelerating these voices. But we also have to build bridges between the traditional and the new. That's the institutions and the activists in order to navigate the changing power dynamic. So we have to create new spaces to connect elected leaders who, who are risk takers with their audience of supports. And we have to uh, have to persuade people in office and in power um, to uh, by providing them this political space and support who want to be change agents. We really need to support our change agents, recognize them and support them. So the other thing I'd like to point out is how we can change the currency of power and what I like to call how do we move into this social capital world where relationships are going to be the primary currency to solve these collective problems for all of our mutual benefit. The highest caliber kind of social capital that an individual or a nation could have for that matter is based on prior collaboration and trust. So uh, figuring out new ways to leverage transparency and to connect and share ideas, uh, one of the ways we can do this is how do we start moving away from the sort of worst case scenario world where we're so ready to pounce and use the military to um, a, a situation where we can use transparency and connectivity to give the benefit of the doubt a little bit longer, to get better information, to rely on distributed expertise. And why is this important? I mean, for, while we're moving in the right direction right now, we have ideas like uh, whole of government uh, resulting from our experience in some, from Somalia to Haiti to uh, New Orleans is another example of resilience in society to Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan. I, when I worked on the Hill, the most interesting thing in all of the testimonies that I went to, almost 90% of them, you had an officer saying, these problems have no military solution. These problems have no military solution. They're about social resilience. They're about politics and relationships and society and power distribution. So our government responded with whole of government strategies for engagement and exit, but what we need is more like a strategy of commitment, and what we need is to embrace whole of society concepts. So, oh, excuse me, I have to, sorry I'm having to use notes, but I'm trying to bungee jump between ideas here. 
So what the internet revolution has created is a world of peers uh, and a sense of entitlement that goes along with that. The, the people around the world expect for themselves what we expect for ourselves today, which is pro possibly it's, this is the greatest promise of democracy, which is self-determination. Basically, it's the the difference between fate and destiny, you choose one and the other chooses you. People want a destiny. They want the interactive option. And we Americans have been preaching this for years, and now the moment is before us. How are we going to act on this expectation? So let me put it bluntly again. In a world of peers, I'm going to kill you is not an effective security strategy, and it's certainly not persuading the right people. Some of the most idealistic individuals I know are either in uniform or in technology. And I think these two worlds have a lot to learn from each other right now. Uh, ask anyone who served in a mission abroad during the 90s up into Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, ask what was the most important experience you had? What are you most proud of? Uh, I guarantee you most of the time it's going to be about building things, not breaking things. It, it won't be so much about the use of force. It will be about how they helped create some kind of positive <laughs> A social change. They know better than anyone that a resilient society and a shared future isn't an accident but an outcome. They've done the best they can with the tools they've had, but our military cannot be responsible for most of these tasks. So I guarantee you that if we continue this over-reliance on the military for carrying out so many of the tasks in the modern world of representing us, we will overreact. And so this is again why we need this security strategy for civil society. We need to move from coercion and towards confidence building, away from exclusion toward participation, away from borders and toward networks, away from security and towards transparency. We need to get really good at democracy. And I'll just close and then we can go into the rest of it for um, Q&A. The other day I was tweeting at an event and I, t I was tweeting about the need to improve and evolve our democracy. And at the end, the relationships are gonna leverage technology, not the other way around. And I got a tweet back that said, haven't you read Lord of the Flies? This can never happen. How many people here have read Lord of the Flies? Pretty sure pretty much everybody. It's a really other, it's a very important metaphor, I think, for today. The synopsis there is a sh bunch of shipwrecked boys on an island uh, with very different character traits, descend into brutal superstition and a Darwinian existence. So what if Simon had had an encrypted smartphone? What if Piggy had commotion, which is a peer-to-peer -peer mesh broadband network that travels through phones and not signal towers? There's no kill switch for dictators. What if Ralph had been able to nudge the crowd towards civilized behavior? Could, it, could they have defeated Jack and his henchman Roger early on? For the rest of us, though, I think the question is, what if the outside world had noticed their plight on that island at the signal fire and not waited until the island was burning down before they responded? So right now we have this great momentum and potential, but we're also experiencing a failure of imagination at many levels in the face of this opportunity. The best question I can come up with as far as disruptive technology is concerned, is it gonna be drones or is it gonna be phones? Which one are we gonna choose? Social capital or coercion and force? And I look forward to enjoying this conversation with the panel and listening to what Tim has to say about actually what I wrote about, which was the cybersecurity section. Thanks, Lorelei. Um, thanks to all of you for coming, and it's a pleasure to um, join so many distinguished panelists. I have now the challenge of trying to connect all of what the uh, four have said um, with the theme of today's talk, um, and I'd like to do that by um, first taking a step back and to look at what is actually new about what we are talking about. Um, second, talk about transparency and volatility, the two themes that um, combine the um, talks that we've heard today. And then three offer a way to think about the challenge um, that the three areas, diplomacy, development, and security, all face together and what the common theme among them is. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to start by um, highlighting that a lot of what we are trying to figure out has already a precedent. How many of you remember <coughs> watching on November 9th, 1989, people going to Brandenburg Gate on TV? Great. So uh, some of you might remember that the reason why people started going to Brandenburg Gate that night was because an East German um, government official had made an announcement on East German television announcing a lift on a travel ban that had been in place for a long time and that was signi constituted a significant change in German policy. 
and you had TV broadcasting this to people in East Berlin, and you, has, you had West German uh, television broadcasting to people in East Berlin how people were going to Brandenburg Gate that night. So the reason why more and more people kept going there was because they were able to watch that some of their neighbors and friends were all of a sudden going to, to the wall and eventually resulted in the fall of the wall. So the TV uh, played a key role in 1989. Fast forward to 2010, uh, a lot more of us probably watched, um, or not watched, but are aware of the man that set himself on fire in Tunisia, triggering the Arab revolutions. That was not because of a centralized TV station broadcasting that. That was because of YouTube and the social media that we already heard about uh, earlier today. Uh, second example, how many of you still remember or watched or read the news about the Pentagon Papers and Daniel Ellsberg? Okay, that's a lot, uh, fewer people. Um, Daniel Ellsberg, when he leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times, considered going to the Harvard Crimson, a student new newspaper at Harvard University, as an alternative if the New York Times would turn down his request to publish the data. When uh, Bradley Manning uh, decided to leak his uh, information, he didn't go to a student paper, but to WikiLeaks. Here you have the analogy also. He didn't go to a centralized kind of institution, a major new uh, media company, but he decided to go to a social media outlet to leak his material. So in both, both cases, we see a trend that signifies a loss of centralized control. And um, if you've seen the uh, latest book by Moises Naim over at the Carnegie Endowment that was uh, released last week, um, he wrote an entire book about the end of power. Um, Joseph Nye at the Harvard Kennedy School does not call it the end of power, um, but he speaks of the transition and the diffusion of power, the latter being the more important one when we talk about um, cyberspace, in that we see a relative diffusion of power from state to non-state actors, not necessarily undermining the central role of states, but we see the increase in the rise of non-state actors that we heard about in terms of the NGOs, in terms of the hacktivists and hackers that we heard about, that Tim, Jim talked about, and Lorelei's um, call for a, a grand strategy that involves civil society. So with that, um, tying that to the, trans to the transparency and volatility themes that we heard about earlier, in terms of transparency, I think, in terms of next step or research, it'll be very interesting to see how we don't just see an absolute rise in the amount of transparency when it comes to government uh, documents, but actually the relative distribution of that transparency. If you think of WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks exposed documents of the US government, not the Chinese government, not the Russian government, so it was a very selective uh, leaking of information. It also leaked only information at the secret level, not the top secret level. So from an academic perspective, there are a lot of biases in terms of that information being leaked and the impact it had. So the way that transparency is being used and the way that information is being disclosed, the way it's distributed, also has a, a power. It's, it's political power and who holds the power to actually release those data. There was a German political scientist who said, WikiLeaks in a sense replaced government as the guardian of secrets. So whereas go the government, and he made the argument that he prefers the government to be the hold of, sec of secrets rather than uh, a group like WikiLeaks, because at least democratic governments are, can be held accountable by their citizens, whereas WikiLeaks is a small group of individuals where the public at large has very little influence to actually determine what they're going to do with the information that they acquired and how they're being leaked. Um, that leads me to the second piece, and this, um, by the way, is um, what uh, Gerald in his paper wrote about in terms of the dark arts that governments will also see their intelligence activities, etc., exposed. So um, it's, it's really a political tool. That leads me to the second theme, volatility, um, and the key factor of speed and the, uh, the shortening of the leash, as we heard earlier in terms of uh, emissaries and um, the, the, reduce, the reduction of autonomy by diplomats in that it becomes not only a lot more... Um, it becomes easier for capitalists to instruct them what to do, but they also have to react to, react to events. Um, my focus has been on cybersecurity. Um, Jim already talked a lot about cyber exfiltration and cyber espionage. Um, the, the additional piece of that is obviously the Stuxnet virus, and um, when we heard uh, in 2010 and read uh, last year in the New York Times that you had for the first time a spillover from the virtual world into the physical world with a SCADA system being attacked and uh, through malware online, and that you're not able to do warfare, not just in the virtual space, but also in the physical space, um, presents a new quality in, um, in the type of activity you can do online militarily. This leads me to the third piece, how can we think about this, or um, one way to think about this is um, Bill Lynn, as many of you will know, wrote an article in 2010 for Foreign Affairs 
defending a new domain, calling cyberspace the fifth domain that the Department of Defense has to uh, defend in addition to land, air, sea, and space. He spoke of cyberspace as a new domain in the military context. I would suggest that this is actually what combines development, diplomacy, and security that all of us are now experiencing cyberspace opening up a new domain for human interaction and a lot of the things that we've uh, seen in these areas now being transposed into this new domain and we're struggling with how do we actually adapt to that. Um, you might have seen a foreign policy piece last week called a new Westphalian system um, that talked about the internet and this talks about this. Um, how many political scientists are in the room? Just a quick show of hands please. Okay, um, so a quick uh, uh, um, outline of what the Westphalian system is. In 1648, you had a peace, actually two peace treaties, which have come to be known as the Peace of Westphalia, that consolidated a uh, war that ravaged in Europe and that basically said, your religion depends on the territory you lived in. It brought to an end a century-long struggle between the secular and the religious forces when after the Roman Empire collapsed, you basically had the secular, the government retreat, and you had the church step in as a parallel structure, structuring a lot of the political and social activity in Europe. Then you had the Reformation, the church split, and that led to the wars in terms of who's Protestant, who's Catholic, that eventually were ended with the Peace of Versailles in 1648. That led the, uh, laid the foundation for the rise of the nation state and the rise of the secular force of the nation state as the predominant political order and actor in international system. And religion, at least in Europe, has been on a retreat since. In many ways, and this is what the FP piece is also about, we see a resurrection of those parallel structures today. If you think of Facebook, Rebecca McKinnon, uh, one of the fellows here at the New America Foundation, wrote a book um, last, that was published last year and talks about Facebookistan and the fact that you have companies whose users are a lot of times broader than, uh, have more people together than individual countries have in terms of population. So you could think, this is a, a bit of a stretch, but an analogy would be that Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter, that their communities are in many ways similar to the kind of religious communities we saw in Europe before the Peace of Westphalia, and are parallel governing structures. And what we, uh, in terms of what we talked about earlier, how do we, how do we structure this and how do we approach this from the development, diplomacy, and security angle uh, comes down to how do we manage this transition where the division between and distinction between foreign and domestic spaces that have structured our international relations for the last centuries continue to disappear because of cyberspace and you have the developing world and the developed world increasingly being connected hopefully leading to more stability, as Joe uh, uh, pointed out, when it comes to fragile states. But a lot of times I think it will also come down to how is that transparency and additional information actually be, being distributed um, um, across in specific circumstances. And with that, I will uh, end by saying, I think what this panel also highlighted is a key challenge for us is to figure out how are we actually trying to think about this? Where do we house it? Is this going to be in communication study, is this a political science field, is this uh, legal studies, military studies. Right now, we see different disciplines all trying to think about the same problem, reinventing the wheel in certain aspects. And I don't think we've really figured out yet how do we actually think about this multidisciplinary problem. Um, and hopefully that will be maybe another went here at the New America Foundation. <laughs> Right. Well, we've had um, a number of incredibly interesting presentations, <clears throat> and uh, we can get to our Q&A now. And I apologize, I may have to drink from this bottle of water. I seem to be having a Marco Rubio moment. So um, <clears throat> please, um, anybody? Yes, and please identify yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Charetta, President of International Investor. Uh, we, we've been an observer of this activity for a long time. Uh, in fairness, I have a question for each of you, but that, that wouldn't be fair to the rest of the audience. So I'm going to try to, to, to bring it down to a single question. Um, and I, I would start with, with Ms. Kelly, if you would, because I think you were the one who, who seemed to portray the most optimistic scenario, or at least hope, the, the prospects uh, that, that more transparency, f freer information could bring us. But my question goes to the heart of that. Uh, because in this era, here in the United States, for example, where we've had this explosion of information, of new media, of new technologies disseminating all this information, 
We've also seen an era where we've seen more income and wealth inequality than ever before. We've seen an era where at least one war has begun with uh, at least questionable justification. We've, we've been in an era where we've seen the rise of intelligence industry and communities like never before. Indeed, the rise of government control of information like never before. So, you know, there seems to be a contradiction between what has happened in terms of all this new information and yet a lot of cause for worry about where it's heading us. I'll just say that I agree with you. I mean, we're at a huge moment of change. I think the next 10 years is really going to determine uh, the, the future, certainly. And I don't mean to be so US focused here. I, I'd like us to get to the point where these conversations have, you know, the United States is a huge uh, social capital innovator in the world. And um, it's important for us to start seeing ourselves in the scheme of things than as the scheme of things. I think one of the reasons I'm optimistic is because I, I left the field of national security and moved into open technology. And there's a lot more happy endings in open technology <laughs> than there was in national security. Um, and I, don't, I think that can change. But um, what, just, uh, what delights me is sitting here next to Mr. Holong and he, hearing him say how cognitive resilience is a security strategy for the United States. That means investment in public education. You have the military itself now talking about social resilience, our ability to rebound, to navigate change, to prosper together as the success of our nation. I think what's happened, though, is that the civilians haven't yet taken up this conversation in a compelling way and reframed our priorities as a country going forward. And this is only going to happen if we build these bridges between these old, traditional, conventional, stodgy institutions and uh, the young people and the energy and ideas and the way they see the world is linked and not ranked. And the way they see the world is simultaneous and not sequential. And this is their intellectual endowment. I still have to think, really hard. I still went to college during the Cold War. And these folks don't. But we have to create the pathways for them. And I noticed this because I went to a lot of the Occupy meetings uh, to see sort of what was being talked about. And the, the problem there was they never created institutionally recognizable steps forward. They didn't have to be acceptable steps forward. They needed to be recognizable steps forward. And that was, I think, what we're going to see next. I think that, they, that that movement for change and this despair of the, of the income distribution in this country and the sense that we're going to spiral downward um, it, it is palpable. It hasn't gone away. It's reorganizing. And my hope is that we can build the bridges so that it reorganizes in, in an optimally productive way. That has to happen in this town, by the way. This is what Washington, D.C. can offer the country as being a connective bridge. And we're living in the last days of Rome here. And in the last days of Rome, I'm sure there were a lot of great restaurants, but there were also a lot of bad ideas. And we have to change that. And that's the role for us now is to be the hub for bringing the outside in. Does that make sense? It does, but it, but it doesn't uh, refute the idea of my notion that many, in many aspects, we seem to be headed down. You know, we're worse off than we were 20 years ago. Well, <clears throat> let's go to a, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, that's a valid point. I think often in, in these discussions, um, you know, you tend to sort of get locked into this, well, I'm optimistic, no, I'm pessimistic, no, I'm optimistic, <laughs> pessimistic sort of battle. And, um, uh, you know, some people have actually written now about let's try and get rid of these pessimist, optimist labels and try and just sort of, I mean, we may have our standpoints, but let's try and actually see objectively, dissect what are the positive aspects and the negative aspects, and maybe they don't cancel each other out. Um, Mike, in the back. <clears throat> Mike Nelson, I write for Bloomberg Government on technology policy, and in my spare time, I'm a professor of internet studies at Georgetown. Um, like Laurel, I am a member of the Cyber Optimist Club, but I really just care about making things better <coughs> step by step. And I want to look at the very bottom level here. We've talked a lot about the geopolitics and the big trends. I want to focus on the people out in the field who are actually trying to use the technology. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, the Internet Society here in D.C. Is, is having a discussion with six Internet heroes. These are 
Internet Freedom Fellows who are sponsored by the State Department. They're helping opening up channels of communication in China, in Azerbaijan, in Syria, Venezuela. The problem is they're getting support from the U.S. State Department. And that, in some cases, almost undermines our effort to support these people because they get painted as stooges of America. I'm wondering if anybody here has ideas on how to get other countries to do more to support these very courageous people who are trying to use encryption and wireless technologies and social media to spread truth, to promote freedom of speech online. And I'm also interested in knowing whether the corporate sector could or should be doing anything here. Do you have any examples of people outside of the U.S. government who have come up with ingenious ways to, to help the freedom fighters in cyberspace? Anybody want to go first? <clears throat> so um, I think one example is actually um, the KS Computer Club in Germany, um, which has been around for at least two or if not three decades. Um, and I'm a Germ I grew up in Germany, so um, I was actually just in Berlin for four weeks in December and January. Um, and I think there's also a very healthy discussion among um, technologists um, to the degree to which they want to be affiliated with a, with a government or the U.S. government specifically in general when it comes to supporting human rights in terms of the what we heard earlier, the, the question of legitimacy and the credibility that they have. Um, and when I was in Germany in January, the, one of the major newspapers actually ran a, um, a rep, uh, rep report on one hacktivist that actively supported um, Syri Syrian uh, human rights activists on the ground um, just by a one-man show because he had the technical skills to assist them and he actually had uh, to quit um, because he had, I believe he was depressed and couldn't handle the ethical uh, challenge that he was facing as part of doing that. Um, so I think when it comes to Germany, there's definitely um, a very active community. I think there were 6,000 uh, participants at the Congress in December. Um, and I'm, I know that in a few other countries you have uh, similar nascent communities. Um, is anybody else on the, <coughs> on the panel? Okay. Um, so I'll depart for a moment from the pessimism of my, uh, uh, my talk to your more optimistic side, notwithstanding Shanti's suggestion that we bridge these gaps. Um, if you ask about the corporations, it seems to me Google, and, uh, uh, for example, has done, has done quite a bit. Um, they're trying to negotiate, for example, a protocol within China that will protect the people who are, you know, on the space from state retribution and yet uh, be able to operate there. And that is clearly going to be a problem in autocratic states. But it seems to me, and it was a Google executive, not necessarily on behalf of Google, who was uh, for 59 nanoseconds, I think, uh, quite a fair fairly lead, in, a, in a leading position in the Egyptian, uh, recent Egyptian, you know, changes a couple years ago. So it seems to me that the, first of all, the technology itself is what's em empowering people to do, to do things. They're able to get, th that's, that's both the, the promise and the problem of the open technology. Anybody can get on there and do almost anything, and it's very difficult for states to deal with that, whether in for benign, for benign reasons or, or malignant reasons. And those two come together. It's very hard to gain um, any kind of control, if you want to put it that way, of how these, how these systems are going to be used. And that, it seems to me, is uh, in a way, that's, that's what your heroes are after. They want to be able to get on uh, into, into cyberspace and take their message out. Unfortunately, uh, as we've seen in technologies all the way throughout probably the, the whole series of, of, of world change, technologies are neutral with respect to how they're used. And so they can be used for, for good purposes and for less good purposes. But I, I think it seems to me that one of the things that the corporations are contributing is, is precisely the technology to make these things more open and transparent than they once were. As the State Department, um, we have a couple of other mechanisms. I don't know how, you know, the National Endowment for Democracy, for example, uh, I think thinks of itself 
in a neutral term, people aren't going to confuse it with the Department of State and so on. I'm not so sure that's true when you go abroad because uh, their money comes from Congress and is part of the budget. So I think the NED congratulates itself possibly more than it ought to about the neutrality of its actions around the world. And if you were to find uh, users or observers of NED um, projects, I don't know if they would, I don't, and that's not a rhetorical question, I just don't know how they're, how they're, how they're viewed. There is an attempt, one last point, in that there was an attempt feebly still gasping for air called the Community of Democracies, which was an attempt to get the democracies of the world, not just the Western donor democracies, but the other democracies as well, to join hands in some of the kinds of work that would promote democracy around the world, including free media and obviously including cyber areas. Um, it's struggling, I would say, uh, and if you asked yourself how much as it accomplished, it might not be as much as, it, as its founders had hoped for. I might just say that I um, consider a hero, Aaron Swartz, uh, an example. Um, I just went to Freedom to Connect, which is another wonderful convening, just happened last week. And, um, you know, he, he, it's a, a tragic ending and an, really unfortunate in so many ways, but that what he did with his young life was you know, grab hold of this idea of, of the redistribution of power and opportunity to make the world a better place. And I really feel like it's incumbent on all of us who really look at, and think about what he did and what he stood for, and, and again, move it forward um, into these institutions, which are, are going to be so rigid and inflexible, and they're going to have to be persuaded and walked into this modern era. And I really feel like the people in this room who look like everyone's around my cohort are the ones that really need to start doing more of that mentoring, creating the bridges, um, and uh, making this change recognizable and not so threatening to the institutions that we have in the United States. It really, it really has to happen here. If we blow it, it's bad for everybody. Not to be ethnocentric, but um, you know, the, the rest of the world pays a lot more attention to us than we pay to the rest of the world, and that's probably not going to change. Maybe in an effort to make it less ethnocentric, uh, I could uh, throw out uh, you know, a notion that what we're really talking about is also changing norms about what uh, and how we see intimidation violence towards bloggers and uh, um, civil society groups and journalists who are trying to disseminate uh, information and gain access to information. I think it's a long-term process, um, but uh, you know there is growing recognition and awareness that's out there. I think uh, one of the proposals I've made is that you know we need to be moving towards a situation where we um, uh, elevate the um, the criminalization of the intimidation towards these individuals. That it's not an ordinary crime when you attack or harass or imprison a blogger or uh, a journalist because these are the eyes and ears of the whole world, really. Uh, and the effects of their si being silenced is, is much greater uh, from a governance, security, uh, and development perspective. And so, you know, there are regional charters in Africa and Latin America and Europe where <clears throat> um, there are legal mechanisms where uh, this idea can be pushed forward, and um, there are courts that can be called uh, upon when the national court systems are not responding uh, to these abuses. And, and there's, uh, uh, there isn't even there is even a push to make the the killing or intimidation of a journalist or blogger a, a crime against humanity as part of the ICC, the Inter International Criminal Court. Diane Perlman, George Mason School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. So far, thanks, that was a great panel. So anyway, Lorelai, you mentioned that there, you talked a lot about coercion and bad ideas, and um, we seem to be organized around you know, coercion, threat, punishment, isolation, sanctions, and a kind of simplistic, immature, world, you know, concrete, black and white worldview of good guys and that going after bad guys. So uh, my question is as far as, and a lot of our policies, and I guess the ones I'm most interested in are sanctions and deterrence, 
are flawed and have the opposite effect. And you know, some decent, well-meaning people totally believe in them, as well as some not so decent, well-meaning who may know that they may not work. So, um, you know, say specifically with Iran and North Korea, um, there's a belief that because they're hurting, it means they're working, and the fact that they're hurting does not mean that they're working. Um, it's making it harder for moderates, increasing popularity of hardliners, hurting innocent people, et, et cetera. So I'm just wondering, in, just in addition to just issues of transparency, in terms of education, I mean, I think some people can be educated and enlightened, um, more psychologically attuned to the effect of these policies on those on the receiving end. Um, so could you relate this to uh, designing policy that right. could um, work? Well, one of the reasons I decided to focus on Congress is because one of our reactions to this as a society to this sort of distributed threat is not to create a distributed solution, which is to bring in more voices um, and include Congress more. It's been to consolidate more power to the executive branch. I just see no good ending coming of this. Um, and so one of the things that could happen, and I commend George Mason because it is such a practitioner-oriented school, especially your program, is the next wall that has to come down is the walls of the ivory tower. Where are our experts? I mean, I've been, I remember being, work, when I worked in Congress, um, the uh, people who had the best knowledge and the highest social capital, meaning their ideas were based on greater goods, and they were not about financial conflicts of interest. They weren't purchasing their access. They were actually writing dissertations about how to improve the world. Those people had great relationships and great expertise and terrible timing. So what we've done with transparency and technology in Congress, and the transparency rules are only two years old now, is we've, uh, we've reduced this problem of time and space. And I know I'm sounding like the twilight zone here, but what we've done with webcast hearings is bring expertise, or is the capacity to bring expertise into the room in real time. So we've, we've, we've lowered the bar for these transactions that, in my view, one of the problems in Washington, D.C. right now is it's basically the whole city is like an information cartel. It's a private market for influence. This will not stand because we're in a world of peers that have a sense of entitlement to their own destiny. And to the sooner we create peaceful, meaningful ways to include more people, the better off we're going to be. And this, to me, when you look at polling year after year, the two institutions of society that come out on top are experts and people in uniform. Again, this is one of the reasons I think that if you listen to a story told by uh, one of our warriors, and, and in, in Joseph Campbell's uh, you know, Power of a Myth, the warrior is one who leaves the tribe and comes back with a story of change, tells a story of change. Conven uh, convene in, in your own hometown with veterans who can talk about this. Not everybody can do it, but there's huge stories of change just waiting to be told around the country. And I feel like that's what the American people, and that's what the millennials, and that's what these new technologies have to offer us. Because it's going to be the relationships that leverage the technology. All technology can do is identify and accelerate. It can't create these meaningful relationships at the end of the day, that's what works in politics. And that I don't think is ever gonna change. Does that make sense? Does anybody else have any thoughts they wanna add on that? I mean, actually, one, what you're saying there is one of the key themes that came out of many of the papers in this volume, which is that, you know, don't lead necessarily with technology when thinking about some of these issues of the information age, because it can lead you into tech-centric solutions that may put all the agency with technology. And in fact, the agency comes from humans, and that's something that Jim stresses in his paper. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, that's good. Yes, we absolutely say that, that people are the core. And I think a lot of times with, you know, talking about cyberspace, and I see this uh, in the military all the time, we want to make it a tech solution. We want to, you know, because that's the, it's easy to grab onto. But in reality, this is people doing things to other people, either connecting for good, either connecting for bad. And, you know, it's, I mean, I look at it kind of like Facebook is kind of honestly like being in the bar. I just get to do it with a lot of different people regardless of time and space. But it's still that interaction with people to, to you know, to achieve some kind of objective. Uh, and we, we just lose sight of that. Yep, um, we should probably wrap up. So let's take both questions and then the panel can respond.
in Town Hall Hui from Chinese Embassy. Um, just now heard this gentleman said, uh, mentioned about Westphalia treaties. Uh, it's very interesting because I didn't catch up with your conclusion. It says um, uh, after West, uh, Westphalia treaty, um, what kind of religion is decided which, which country you are, whether you are Catholic or whether you are Protestant? It's be, it's be, uh, depend on which country you are. Uh, what's your implication? It means uh, in the future, the cyberspace, what kind of cyberspace the practice or standards is decided what country you are or, or something else? Can you elaborate that? Oh, Tim, hang on. Let's take one more question. We'll do it all at once. Hi, I was just maybe for Mr. Herlong in particular. Could you identify uh, yourself? Chase Beamer. Um, if you were talking about the first two portions of your, your cognitive dominance, I think the understanding of the landscape is particularly pertinent to, to those two factors. And, and where do you think PII, personally identifiable information, and the government's collection of PII, maybe in the non-IC, uh, uh, particularly European populations, American populations, you know, where do you think the, the legal line is there? Thank you. Um, well, okay, so um, why don't you guys respond, and then if anybody else on the panel wants to give some sort of wrapping up statement or concluding statement, please feel free to do that as well. So, Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, it's interesting. I, I don't think we thought about PII in terms of looking at cognitive dominance, and I'm obviously not, not a lawyer. Um, so if you're looking for kind of my, my views on, on should the government should not be, not be collecting, I'm trying to understand your question. Well, I mean, legally, do you think the government is permitted to collect? Well, they do. I, I mean, yeah, so for, for certain things. And there obviously has to be some kind of expectation of privacy um, and, you know, in proper use for that information. The way, and since it's very easy to collect a large amount of information, share it very easily, are there potentials for abuses? Sure, and, and that's going to be a challenge. And um, can you always totally rule it out? No, but, the you know, necessary for certain governmental functions, you need to collect it, so. Um. Okay, Tim, do you want to respond? Yeah. Um, I think that's a key challenge of what we're trying to figure out, that the Peace of Westphalia was based on the notion of uh, geographic borders, which do not exist in the virtual dimension of cyberspace. So the, to, to respond to your question, um, we right now face the struggle of trying to figure out how we, uh, what legal standards do we choose to adopt, the domestic legal standards or the, the legal standards we've developed for international affairs. And I think right now there's a translation exercise that we have to do in uh, uh, using a lot of what we already know exists in terms of international humanitarian, for example, making sure that the Geneva com Conventions also apply to cyberspace. And um, last year we saw the Human Rights Council affirm that human rights apply offline as well as online. Um, but I think that's the, the key challenge. How do we translate um, existing notions that were framed by national uh, geographic borders into a space where that is not existent in, in the virtual dimension, not at the physical level when it comes to actually how where that is resting on physical, uh, on, on land, et cetera. Does anybody on the panel want to offer any concluding thoughts? Just one sentence. And that is, it seems to me that what you have here in the last 10 years anyway is a growing volatility of context what are the building blocks of society and international as well as domestic? And secondly, a volatility of communication and transparency in the form of these new technologies. And it seems to me it's the burden now to figure out what kind of order can be brought out of this because the alternative is kind of international chaos in which all kinds of good and bad things can happen without some kind of rules about how this is going to operate. I realize that sounds um, Orwellian, but I think um, if you don't have some kind of order out of this, you're, you really are uh, releasing all of these things to all kinds of forces, some good and some not. Anyone else? To end on a, on a happier note, go civil society. We, <laughs> we need to nudge that right now in every different way that we can. And everybody in this room has more agency. That means individual power now than ever before in human history. So nudging it on, on behalf of the life-affirming shared future is really, I think, uh, bringing it right back down to your laptop. <laughs> Tim, did you want to? No. Okay, in that case, um, we are just about out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you to New America, and thank you to the panelists for a great discussion today.